أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعنة الدائم على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين For the love of our beloved Prophet and his beloved progeny, please recite a second loud salawat. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم For the hastening in the return of our beloved 12th Imam, a third final loud salawat. اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم. I hope everyone is doing well, inshallah. I know that this week we heard uh, the news of this vaccine that's coming up, but of course we have to emphasize that from now until this vaccine is available, we still have maybe months to go. And so we still want to take our precautions and we still want to be safe and we still want to take care of ourselves. And we still want to protect our bodies and our health and our family members and our relatives and everyone that uh, might be around us. So I just wanted to emphasize this. We have come this far. If we started, I think, in March, I still remember the weekend that we started in March. Uh, I think it was March 12th where we started to shut down all of our programs. Up until today, I think it's been maybe six, seven months. I think like, like most of you guys, I've lost count of time now. But inshallah, if we have two, three, four, five months to go, uh, and hopefully it won't be that long, but you never know, um, we just want to, you know, inshallah, stay safe until that uh, opportunity comes. If we've been able to be patient this long, then let's be patient uh, moving forward. I say this because we know in Texas the numbers are just going up, and it's becoming worse really by the second. So uh, this is something we need to still be careful of until hopefully... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts a solution in front of us, inshallah. Uh, and this actually ties in with the topic that we're going to discuss for tonight, inshallah. So the topic that we're going to discuss for tonight has to do with the idea of the freedom and the liberty of the human being. The freedom that the human being has in the sense that the human being is not supposed to accept the authority of any other being upon itself. The human being has a freedom that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed it with. And because he is blessed with this freedom, he is not supposed to accept the authority of any other entity or any other being upon itself. Sometimes this entity and this being might be a society, for example. Sometimes it might be another individual. Sometimes it might be even himself. And this is why I said this topic actually that we're discussing tonight ties, ties in with this point that I was making. The freedom that the human being has is such that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not given me permission to impose authority over myself. Even if that authority is supposed to come from me, meaning that I do something to my body, I do something to my health that is detrimental to my health. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not given me this permission. Similarly, He has not given me permission to allow others to take me under their authority to impose their authority upon me, unless it's an authority that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recognizes, like the authority of a parent, for example. The authority of a parent within our fiqh, within our jurisprudence, it is recognized to a certain extent. Of course, there are certain places where it doesn't apply, but of course, it covers a whole lot of ground, the authority that a parent will have. Well, this is authority that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has essentially acknowledged and recognized for me to take upon myself. Or for example, the authority that a child has over their parents, the rights that a child has over their parents. And believe it or not, there is such a thing that children also have an authority. They also have a, a right that they can impose upon their parents. Now what is that? We have to discuss that some other time, inshallah, we'll get into that. And we'll discuss that, but at the end of the day, it's an authority that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has recognized, again, to a certain extent. And to that extent, 
I can take that authority and impose it upon myself. But if it's an authority that has not been recognized, if it's an authority that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not acknowledged, then of course if I impose that upon myself, then that's going to become a problem. And this is why in Islam, the human being is said to have been created as a free individual. And because he is free, as the ahadith say, the hadith says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you free, so therefore do not allow anyone to impose their authority upon you. You are created hur, you are created with freedom, and you are not to allow anyone to impose their freedom, impose their authority over you. This is also where this concept comes from that we have in our, in our Quran and in, and in a hadith. That a believer, a mu'min, he is also not supposed to allow anyone to humiliate him. He's not supposed to allow anyone to disrespect him. This doesn't mean that he makes sure no one says anything disrespectful to him. That's not possible. Meaning that he doesn't do something that will bring about the disrespect of others. It goes back to the same concept. Because this is a form of authority. This is a form of, superior, superior, of being superior. That this person is now allowing, whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not allowed this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not allowed a believer to be under the authority of another. And when he does something and he allows others to disrespect him, he allows others to humiliate him, he allows others to just step all over him, then essentially he is allowing for their authority to be imposed on him. And that's why in multiple ahadith we have that the Ahlul Bayt, when they used to come across sahaba of theirs who would do something that would bring about the disrespect of others, who would bring about the humiliation of others, they would forbid them of such things. Amongst those was the way they would dress. If a companion dressed in a way that brought about the humiliation of others, the, the imams and the a'imma, would forbid this person from wearing this type of clothing. If they would speak in a manner, if they would do something that would bring about the disrespect and humiliation of others, they would not want this. Why? Because this is a form of that person becoming superior upon the believer. And this is something that we don't believe in within Islam. So this is as it relates to the authority that someone else wants to impose on me. This is all clear and of course it has its own discussion. And this is where, you know, social justice comes into the picture and so on and so forth, which is not the topic that we're discussing tonight. Then beyond that, beyond this type of captivity, beyond this type of loss of your freedom, there's a different type of captivity that our ahadith and the verses of the Qur'an also are concerned with. And you can't necessarily say if they're more concerned with this or less, but in some ways you can say they are more concerned with this type of captivity and this captivity is not one that is imposed from the outside that's one form of it this is a captivity that is imposed within the human being it is a captivity that starts and ends with the human being itself you see normally when we talk about freedom when we talk about the opposite of it captivity we're talking about two different entities, right? You know, one entity that comes and enslaves, one entity that comes and imposes its authority over the other. Like we read, for example, in the history of North America in particular, of the slave trade that was going on and the Atlantic slave trade that was going on and how many people, their authority was imposed on them. This is authority of one group of people imposed on another group of people. The captivity that Quran and Hadith also speak about is the captivity that does not start with one entity and you know ends with another entity. It's the captivity that starts and ends with the same entity. And this is why it's kind of hidden. And this is one of the main reasons why religion, one of the main functions of religion, is to let the human being know that in this dynamic, this type of captivity is hidden. And it's here to awaken the human being to not live a life of captivity. Because in this life of captivity, this form of it, your hands are not tied, there's no chains around your hands, there's no ropes around your hands. It doesn't come off as, as you losing your freedom. And that is exactly the problem. And that is why Quran and Hadith are so concerned with it. Because it goes hidden and it goes unknown to you. Okay, in this type of captivity, in this type of loss of your freedom, the one who is, is, is taking away the freedom of others becomes the captive. One more time, when you look at captivity from this perspective, 
in the situation where one person enslaves another one, the one who is enslaving the others, he is in truly, in reality, being enslaved. How does that make sense? This type of captivity that we are speaking about is the captivity where the desires of the human being tie the hands of the human being. Meaning that the desires of the human being get the best of the human being. The human being, he has this lofty status, he has this divine status, his soul comes from somewhere that is very pure, and then his desires reach a point where they tie the hands of his soul. His soul is divine, his soul divine, his soul is beautiful, his soul is lofty, but then these desires tie the hands of this soul, and the soul now starts to do evil things. And when the soul starts to do these evil things, it has now lost its freedom because desires have now come and they have taken authority. They have now become the captains of this ship. And because of that, the, the hands of his soul are now tied. And based on this, you see that the one who normally we look at him and we say, this one enslaved this person, and we look at this person as the victim, based on this captivity that we are now speaking of, the captivity where the desires are captivating someone, based on this, the one who enslaves others is being enslaved in reality because now his soul is dying. His soul is suffocating. And this type of captivity is what Quran and Hadith is mostly concerned about. And this is where, inshallah, we'll enter into our Ahadith. The first is from Ali ibn Abi Talib. Salawatullahi wa salamu and he says this, he says, shahwa, The one who has been defeated by his desires, the one whose hands are tied by his desires, his desires are getting the best of him. Min this person has lost more freedom compared to the one who is enslaved. The one who's enslaved externally, they've, they've tied his hands. But the one whose desires are getting the best of him, this person is more of a captive. He's more of an asir. His hands are tied more than the one who is enslaved from a physical perspective. So it shows that Quran and Hadith, they are even more concerned with this. Not that the first one is not a problem. No, the first one is a problem too. And how Islam came about and discussed and approached this whole topic of slavery is a discussion for another time. Islam's approach was a very, very wise approach. It's an approach that if you had given us the issue of slavery, you and me, and we wanted to figure out how to approach it, we naturally would have approached it probably in a different way. And Islam approached it in a very wise manner. And this is, of course, the topic of a very deep historical study that scholars of Islam have been doing specifically today uh, in, in this day and climate where the issue of slavery has now taken on that moral aspect that it's taken on today. So that's a topic for another time. But you find Quran and Hadith are more concerned about this than the other one. Why? Because this one's hidden. Because this one takes place and you can't really tell. Okay. Then they start to explain a little bit more what happens that this person loses his freedom. What happens that this person becomes a captive based on the second type of captivity. Second type of isara or asara. He says this, another hadith from the first imam. He says, وَمَنْ تَرَكَ shahawat." The one who can walk away from his desires, he is free. And the one who can't walk away from his desires, his hands are tied up. So what the hadith is telling us is that if I want to be able to be free, I have to walk away from these desires of mine. Okay, this part makes sense. But how exactly am I supposed to do that, brothers and sisters? What does it mean for me to walk away from my desires? At the end of the day, my life is all based on desires. I have desire for food and I go and I eat dinner as some of you might be eating right now or will eat, you know, maybe in an hour or so. I become thirsty. I have a desire for water. So my whole life is based on desires. Yes, I have a desire to be with the opposite gender. Therefore, my marriage takes place. I have a desire to have children. Therefore, there's a progeny for mine. There's an offspring for me. My whole life is based on desires. What does it mean I'm supposed to walk away from my desires? How am I supposed to go about this? This is the vagueness that now Islam comes to tell us how to approach this issue. Am I supposed to go and sit in some cave and say, no, no, whatever I want, I'm not going to do it. I want food, so I'm not going to eat the food. I want water, so I'm not going to eat the water or drink the water. I want this, I'm not going to do it. Is this how I'm supposed to go about it? And of course not. 
So how is it that when I walk away from these desires of mine, how am I supposed to do that? Practically speaking, how does this implement itself in my day-to-day -day life? This is where Islam comes into the picture. And Islam tells us, listen, if you want to be able to walk away from these desires, you just have to limit them. You have to manage them. To a certain extent, you can fulfill them. But if they go beyond a certain extent, you have to cut them off. But where is that limit? Where do I draw that line? Wonderful. That's the million dollar question, brothers and sisters, in life. Where do I draw the line? To what extent is this desire of mine fine? To what extent of it does it now become a means of tying my hands? To what extent of it is fine, part of life? To what extent of it now becomes an addiction? See, drawing the line is very critical. This drawing of the line is why we have our jurisprudence, is why we have our fiqh, is why we have our halal and haram. When Islam says, listen, this part of this deed is haram, that means that now, up until this point of it that was halal, of this desire, it's not going to tie your hands. If you do it, your soul will still have its freedom. But now if you go beyond this level, then now you are tying the hands of your soul. To this extent of your desire to be with the opposite gender is okay, there's marriage and all of that stuff. But then you go beyond that, this is where Islam calls it haram. Why? Because now it's going to tie the hands of your soul. Now your soul is going to be tied down. Now your soul is going to start to lose its freedom. I want to eat. This is a desire I have. No problem. Up until this point of it is fine. But then if you start to become extravagant, then Islam says, well, you have to draw the line here. Because now it's not just a matter of fulfilling your desire. Your desire is now getting the best of you. Your desire is now tying the hands of your soul. Your soul is not going to be able to be free if you're fulfilling this desire to this extent. And this drawing of the line is something that Islam has done in every single aspect of our lives. For those who remember, when we were discussing the topic of the difference in the life of a Muslim and an atheist who might be a moral individual, we talked about this a little bit near the end of the talk. That Islam starts to draw lines. Everyone says modesty is good, but how do you define modesty? How does that implement itself in my life? To what extent of modesty is necessary for me? Where do I draw the line? This is what Islam does for us, brothers and sisters. And to wrap up this point as I move on to the next point, if you want to be free, you have to limit your desires. And this seems to be a contradiction. It sounds like a contradiction, but this is the reality of the world that we live in. You want to be free? That means you can't just do everything you want to do. Sounds like a contradiction because normally when they ask us what does it mean for you to be free, we say, oh, well, that means I get to do whatever I want to do, yes? Sometimes you've heard, for example, kids when they wake up in the morning, they have to go to school and they say, you know what, I wish I, wish I didn't have to go to school. I wish I was like you, Baba, you know, like sometimes kids will say things like this. I wish I was like you, Baba, or like I was like you, uh, my mom. You guys get to do whatever you want to do. I hope that point comes where I retire. Why? Because when I retire, then I get to do whatever I want to do. And that's, of course, in their own understanding. So if you ask the human being, you say, what does it mean to be free? The human being will say, oh, that means I get to do whatever I want to do. And that's our definition of freedom. But then hadith and Quran are here to tell us that if you take a look at it and you want to approach it in that manner, then whatever you want to do, those desires of yours, after a while, they will tie your hands. And those desires that you thought were the source of your freedom, they themselves become the source of your captivity. It's a very delicate discussion. These desires to a certain extent are a source of your freedom. You fulfill them too much, all of a sudden these same desires become the source of your captivity. If someone wants to be free in life, they have to limit these desires, which is only explained properly within the religion. So to wrap it up, if you want to be free, you now have to become the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to become the follower of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because He will tell you where to limit these desires and where to cut it off. That's the only way to be free in life. You know, sometimes people say that, you know what, I don't want to listen to God. I just want to be free. No problem. 
try to be as free as you want, you know? Try to do whatever you want to do. Before you know it, those same desires will start to get the best of you. Those same desires will now become a problem for you. That's why you see successful people in life, wherever you find success in life, there is discipline that comes along with it. What is discipline? Discipline means that I fulfill my desires, but then I limit it. Entertainment is, in, is there in my life, but I limit it to a certain extent. Socializing is there, but I limit it. Eating and drinking is there, I limit it. Relationships are there, but I limit it. Because there's no success, there's no freedom unless you limit these desires, which I, as I said, Islam shows us where exactly to draw the line. These, this drawing of the line is what we call halal and haram. Halal and haram is not God sitting there and trying to act, forgive me, tough and rough and trying to act like he's in charge and saying, oh, this is what you should do. Otherwise, you know, you're going to be in trouble. This is not what halal and haram is. Halal and haram is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us where you draw the line. Because from this point onwards, your soul is going to be tied down now. And there's more that comes from this concept. We don't have time to go into that. So now amongst those Harams, amongst those things that tie down the human being, amongst those desires that tie down the human being, some of them, the ahadith of the Ahlul Bayt, speak of them. Amongst those is the desire of the human being for wealth and for objects, what we would refer to as consumerism. I want this iPhone, and then the 11 comes out, I want 11, then 11 comes and goes and it gets old, then you want 12. Yes, and of course 20 years from now people will look back and laugh at you that you had a 12. This consumerism is something that you will find ties down the human being. And on the other hand of this consumerism, what do you have? You have this, con this concept in Quran and Hadith which is referred to as Al-Qana'ah. Al-Qana'ah means that I am content with the limited things that I have, as long as those limited things will take care of the fundamental and necessary needs of mine. This is qana'a on one hand, consumerism on the other hand. Hadith says, al hurru abdun. He says a person who's free, physically speaking, socially speaking, he's a free individual, right? He's not born a slave or anything like that. al hurru abdun. He's a slave if ma tamir, as long as he has greed. Meaning that, that that greed is going to tie down his soul. His soul will not become lofty. Why? Because as much as it wants to elevate itself, this greed will hold it down. When he's going to sleep at night, he's worried. He's concerned. Why? Because this person has this and I don't have it. This one is more beautiful than me. This one has more popularity than me. Usually we talk about greed in the sense of wealth. It's not confined to wealth. This one... His, his social media is like this. This one, his popularity is like this. This one's parents are like this. This one's connections are like this. All of these, the idea that the human being worries so much about these is a form of greed. And the hadith is saying that this ties down the human being. This won't let the human being fly and elevate itself. He says, As long as he's greedy, he can, you know, people can call him a free person, but in reality, he's a slave. Slave, enslaved by others? No, he's enslaved by himself. And then the hadith continues. He says, And maybe someone is born as a slave, but in reality, he's a free man or a free woman. Why? Why? When he is content with what he has. As they say, if you're content with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to you, you are the wealthiest of people. You're the richest of people. There's no one who has more than you. If you're content with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to you. He says a free man can be a slave if he's greedy. A slave can be a free man if he's content. This is one of those desires. And this is something we have to keep in mind. Why? Because now we're coming to that time of the year, brothers and sisters, where corporations are going to make millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. I should say billions. Billions of dollars. Off of this, these desires of the human being. Yes, now you're going to come. There's this Black Friday. Then after that, you're going to have, you know, you're going to come closer to the holiday season, the holidays that we have here in this society. And, of course, what happens with that? Consumerism, at its best, you're going to see it. 
and this person is going to buy this, and that person is going to buy that, and this one's going to buy that. And no one's asking, do I even really need these things? Am I wasting my time on these things? Am I wasting my money on these things? No one's going to ask that. It's just a consumerism. And of course, you know that the U.S. is at the very top, at the very top of the list <laughs> of countries when it comes to consumerism. Yes? This is, we're going to come to those times now. And this is a question we have to ask ourselves. When I'm spending this money, first of all, what is it doing to my soul? That I keep telling my soul that you need this and you need that and you need this and you need that. Oh, but there's this sale. Okay, there's a sale. But do you even need it though? You know that like they say, they say you want to save 100% on a sale. Just don't buy that thing that you don't need. You save 100% of it instead of saving 80, 70, 60%, you know, whatever the case, whatever the sale is. And then that's one thing, how this ties down my soul. That's one thing. The other thing is, what is this money? What, what can this money do for other people who are in need? What can this money do for my own future? Even if someone says, I don't want to help anybody else. What can it do for my own future? And if you're the type who wants to help others, this is a serious question we have to ask ourselves. What can this money do for other people who are in need? I will say this, brothers and sisters, and I wasn't planning on talking about this, but this is, you know, as I get into the talk, these are points that come to my mind. This, the, 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 this, uh, the, the money that we spend and the consumerism that we have in this country, if you really want to put it into perspective, you have to understand that if you live in this country, just by living in this country, and if you live an average life in this country, you are amongst the very, very small group of people who live on the whole earth. You are amongst the wealthiest people on earth. And you might say, well, Sheikh, I'm not part of the 1%. Yes, I'm not talking about the 1%. I'm, I'm talking about the wealthy people as it relates to the population of the earth. Just by living in this country. Just the fact that you live here, if you live an average life, and most of us do, if you live an average life, you are amongst the wealthiest of human beings on planet earth. So when you then go and you start to spend money on this and that, and this consumerism starts to build inside of us, and sometimes it might even be israf, and sometimes it might even be haram, but even if it's not, think about what this money can do for others in other people's lives. And think about what you can do with this money if you sent it forward for yourself towards the next world. This famous hadith, person came to the Prophet, he said, Ya Rasulullah, why is it that we fear death? لِمَاذَا نَخَافُ الْمَوْتِ why is it that we fear death? And the Prophet asked him, he said, Lakamalun, you have any wealth by any chance? You have any money, any, any uh, commodities, anything that you own? He said, Ya Rasulullah, yes, naam. He said, have you sent them forward for yourself? Have you sent this wealth ahead of you? In the sense that, have you given from it so that on the day of judgment it's there for you? He said, La. He said, no, I've never done that. He said, this is why you're afraid of death. Because you've kept everything here. You've spent everything on this world. The idea of the next world comes up. You're worried because you know you never sent anything. You didn't prepare for that test. This is the time to prepare for that test. I'm living in a country where opportunities are presented to me. I have to be aware of these opportunities. And brothers and sisters, this is one of the most important principles that we have to teach our children. It's not an easy thing to do. But we have to teach our children for them to have an awareness of the conveniences that they have in their lives. Just living an average life, below average life in this country, you are amongst the wealthiest of people on, the, on planet Earth. So before I go out and I start to tie my soul down with this object and that object and all of this, let me think about this as we're coming to this season of consumerism, as I will call it. As we're coming to it, we have to think about this. So amongst those desires that tie my hands, as the hadith is saying, is this, is at-tama, greed. And this is why in the hadith of Ali ibn Abi Talib, beautifully he mentions, he says this, he says, أَلَا حُرٌ يَدَعُ هَذِهِ اللُّمَاضَةَ لِأَهْلِهَا He says, is there any free man or woman, free human being, to look upon this world and the objects and the commodities, the houses you can buy, the cars you can buy, the phones you can buy, the devices you can buy, whatever it is that you're into. He says, Ala hurrun Is there any free man or woman to leave this, this dunya? But pay attention to the word that he uses for the dunya. 
You know, sometimes, forgive me, this is just the wording of the hadith and that's why I'll go into it. You know, sometimes when you eat something and then you swallow the food and then there's a little bit, some pieces of food that are still in your mouth, yes, and you floss and you get rid of that. In, in Arabic means what? Means the food that has remained in your mouth, yes? It's, it's something you're supposed to get rid of. It's something you don't fight over. It's something you don't value. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, where are the free men and women who will look upon the pleasures of this world in this manner and they won't kill themselves for this? They understand it's just something that's part of life and you move on from it. You don't sit there and sell your soul to these things, which is what happens when you get into consumerism. He says, are there any free men or women to do, to do this? إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ لِأَنفُسِكُمْ ثَمَنُونَ If you want to sell yourself to something, if you want to spend your life on something, here's something that's worth spending your life on. إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ لِأَنفُسِكُمْ ثَمَنُونَ إِلَّا الْجَنَّةِ There's nothing that you would rather spend your life on or would be worthy of your life except for heaven. Heaven is a good price for your soul. You want to give up your soul for heaven? You can go ahead and do that. الثَّمَنَ إِلَّا الْجَنَّةِ فَلَا تَبِعُوهَا إِلَّا بِهَا Don't sell yourself short to anything other than heaven. When it comes to this world, be a free man and woman. Understand that these things are not worth it for you. They are not a valuable price in return for your soul. The more I want to be free, brothers and sisters, the more I have to stay away from haram. There's no other way to build spiritual freedom than to stay away from haram. That's the first step, and that is the most important step. And of course, for most of us, most of our life, we're not engaged in haram, but then there are certain harams that pop up every now and then. And the human being who is able to eradicate these, then his soul truly becomes free. The one who says, yes, I'm spiritual, I have the spiritual freedom, but at the same time he has haram in his life, this person is still tied down, whoever it is, myself. If I have haram in my life, I'm still tied down. doesn't matter how spiritual I feel. We've talked about this before. Spiritual freedom, it doesn't come from feelings. Feelings play a role, emotions play a role, there's no doubt about it. But that's not how you gauge it. You gauge it based on your actions. As long as I have haram in my life, then my soul is tied down. But when I remove this haram from my life, then my soul becomes free. And the more free I become, the easier it is for me to leave this world. The easier it is for me to go from one world to another world because I'm not holding on too tight to the pleasures of this world. Doesn't mean you have to go live in a cave. No, it just means that you have to stay away from those things that your marja refers to as haram. Those things that Islam calls haram. Stay away from those things and your soul will become free. Sometimes those things have to do with your dress code. Sometimes they have to do with how you treat other people. Sometimes it has to do with your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's all different aspects of our life. But as long as I have haram in my life, my soul is going to be tied down. With that, inshallah, we'll bring this portion of our talk to an end. I want to talk a little bit about the ahkam of uh, traveling and praying. So in the Shia fiqh, and of course in the, in, in the fiqh of Ahl sunnah as well, but more so in the, in the fiqh of uh, the Shia school of thought, there's a particular discussion as it relates to when someone is traveling and the particular rulings that apply to the human being when he is traveling. So this is where we will delve into this topic. This topic, of course, is a very detailed topic. I'll try to explain it in a simple uh, manner that is not too detailed, and we won't go through all the rulings, but it's important to have a general understanding of it. So number one, what happens when I'm traveling? How do things change for me when I'm traveling? Number one, of course, we know that your dhuhr, asr, and isha prayer, they go from four rakats to being two rakats. And of course, fajr and maghrib, they stay the same, even though many of us would want for Fajr to become one rak'at and for Maghrib to become a uh, rak'at and a half, that unfortunately doesn't happen. It's only your Duhur, Asr, and Aisha that go from two, from four to two. That's number one. Number two, the nafilas that you pray, you can no longer pray while you are traveling. That's number two. Now when it comes to the nafila of Aisha, there's a special discussion on it, some details there. But just to be on the safe side, you don't have to do that. So the nafilas, you also cannot do. Number three is that, of course, you cannot fast while traveling. 
Ayatul Sistani does have a particular exception when it comes to these to this ruling as it relates to traveling and fasting, uh, but that's a separate thing. Uh, for the most part, you can't travel, you can't fast while you are traveling. Okay. First question that we have to go through is what is it that makes someone uh, a traveler? What are the conditions that need to be fulfilled? Number one is that this person, he has to travel at least the distance of 26 miles. That is including the outbound and the inbound trip. In other words, if he goes somewhere that's 14 miles going there and he comes back, that's going to be 28 miles, yes? Then he is going to be considered a traveler. Now, before I go on to the other conditions, very important question that I've, I've received many times before, this is, this is that question. That sometimes you might travel 30 miles, but you're in the same city. As long as you're not considered a traveler from the common view, people look at you and say, you are not traveling, you're just in the same city. As long as that is the case, none of these rulings of traveling apply to you. Yes, if you go out of the city and people say, oh, he left the city, now he is traveling, now he's going on a trip, then yes. And I say this, of course, because this is a ruling that comes into mind when we talk about big uh, metropolitan cities, like DFW would, want, would be one of them, Los Angeles would be another one of them, uh, even some parts of uh, Detroit would be of this uh, example as well, Toronto as well. These are all examples where you find this situation. If you are traveling, or you are, you know, you're in your car and you're going from one point to another point. And from the perspective of people, you're not leaving one city and entering into another city. This is all part of one big city, even though it might have different names, even though it might have different individual cities. When I come to CFK, for example, I go from Carrollton to uh, Colony. So these are different, you know, cities, technically speaking. But from the common view, people do not uh, you know, look at these as different cities. They say, no, you live in Dallas, for example. You didn't go on a trip, you just went to work. That's just your commute, right? So as long as the, tr the traveling I am doing is within this context, none of these rulings are going to apply. Yes, if I go from one point to another point and people say, oh, look, he's starting a trip. Now he is traveling. Then yes, I'm going to start calculating this distance, and if this distance going and coming back is 28 miles, or 26 miles, I should say, or 27 to be on the safe side, then this is going to be considered a trip for me, and I'm going to be considered a traveler. So that's the first condition. Second condition is that while I'm going on this trip, I have to have the intention of traveling that far, which is normally the case. There are certain situations may that, where this condition may not be there. Number three, that while I'm traveling, I don't pass through a place that is considered my watan. And for the lack of a better term, we'll refer to watan as a hometown. Somewhere where, and we'll talk about this more in detail, somewhere where you were born and grew up, or a place where you've stayed for a, a notable amount of time. How much time is that? We'll get to that later on. Okay, that's the third condition. Fourth is that you do not start praying Qasr until you leave the city. You do not start praying Qasr until you reach the city limit. What is the city limit? We will discuss that inshallah in the next uh, session. And the last one is that while he is going there, he cannot change his mind. If he changes his mind midway, then he has to restart the calculation of this distance. Again, not something that happens very much, but this is one of the condition. So inshallah next week we'll talk about this. First of all, what does it mean for me to leave the city limits? What are the city limits? That's a very important uh, question to ask. Number two is this distance, are there any conditions as it relates to this distance or not? Inshallah these we will delve into in our following sessions. I'm just going to check real quick to see if we have uh, any questions. Okay, I do see one question here, and that is this. What about the, uh, the nafila of Salatul Layl? Uh, that's a good question. I don't remember the ruling on that. 
I don't remember the ruling on that. So inshallah, I will try to find out that ruling and inshallah next week I will provide an answer to it. I can't remember to be honest right now uh, whether that also, whether that is possible or not to be honest. But as it relates to the other nawafil, that is not uh, going to be possible. Inshallah with that we'll bring tonight's talk to an end. If in case I forget to answer that question, if the sister can mention it next week as well, and I will, um, inshallah, definitely delve into that. Before we end, let us take a moment to recite Surah Fatiha for all of your marhumin and marhumat with a loud salawat ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen ar-Rahman ar-Rahim maliki yawm al-deen. Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka na'asta'een. Ihdina al-sirat wa al-mustaqeem. Sirat wa al-lazina al-amta alayhim. Ghayr al-maghdub alayhim wa al-dadeen.